Hi everyone, I'm Sandy Lene. Welcome to Psychic Creations. We are on location at the wonderful Edward D. Sweeney Building in Carson City, Nevada. It's one of the original buildings of Carson City and one that I have written a book about. The owner of this building, which now houses Morley's books inside, he and I are going to be giving a lecture today about the building, about our book, about the history, and about the spirits that live inside. So thank you for joining us, and let's go have some fun. All right, well, I would like to introduce myself, Sandy Lene of Psychic Creations, and this happens to be... I'm Mike Morley, the current owner of the Sweeney Building, which houses Morley's books. If you name it after yourself, it better be good. Uh. <laughs> and it is. It's an awesome store. Uh, or a bookstore, I should say. Yes. You bet. All right, well, how this book was born was actually my producer, Michael J. Smith, knows Michael Morley. And Michael J. Smith asked me to come on in and talk to Michael Morley about selling my books in this bookstore, which I did. And so we got to talking and I said, this is a beautiful old building, which it is. It's one of Carson City's original buildings. And I said, Michael, has anybody ever written a book about this? He said, no. And I said, well, I'm going to. And he said, okie doke. <laughs> and it worked out well. I mean, you, know, you almost might say the task grew in the telling. I mean, it started out as just a conversation, and, and I, you ran with it. I, I was did. impressed with how fast you were able to, to move. I mean, you're very, very motivated, and a lot, a ton of research. Yeah. And I'm grateful because a lot of, of the old buildings didn't survive. Uh, this is one of a handful that did. And so I think you know, Sandy has done the community a service by, by capturing the history of the building while still hopefully forever, in a long time, in, in good shape. And so, thank you, Sandy. Oh, well, thank you for yeah. allowing me to write about this. This was awesome. We had some really good in, uh, history and information and research done by Nevada Historical Society's docent, Arlene LaBerry. She was very instrumental in a lot of the history of this building. So, all right. Well, the book was born, actually, in February of 2015. So, yay, <laughs> very cool. Now, the building here was built in 1864, and it was a building that was meant to be for businesses. It wasn't a residential house. It was used that way later on in years. Yes, the original intent um, was, it was the Wells Fargo building, not the bank, which came some 20 or 30 years later, but um, a livery, a hotel, dry goods. Um, uh, this was the place as a stagecoach stop when you st when you came into Carson. Um, if you look at the old pictures, I think you have one in the book. Mm -hmm. You can actually read dry goods, uh, but it is one. It is one of the original buildings. This is ground zero for downtown, the old downtown Carson City, and it's, it's now, now it's. Um, well, I won't jump ahead. Oh, well, that's okay. That's all right, because this happened to be the most prominent corner in Carson City. Yes, this was once the main drag. Mm -hmm. This was once the, 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 uh, the center of, of Carson mm -hmm. City. Mm -hmm. And actually, this, the road to the north of us was once called the Lincoln Highway. And that went all the way up to Lake Tahoe. And it went like this. <laughs> so that's awesome. And actually, the road that is to the north, um, the east of us, that was actually called Ormsby Street at one time. Yes, mm -hmm. I think in the 50s it changed to Curry. It did. Mm -hmm. They moved Ormsby Street about a mile up off King. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, moving all the streets around, just like they used to do with old houses way back when too. Well, just in brief, to tell you a little bit about the genealogy of the business and the, the owners of the building, they actually, the very first occupant was attorney or Orion Clemens, who in 1860 was the secretary of the Nevada Territory and acting governor when, uh, well, actually Governor 
Nye was like out of town, which was a lot of the time. <laughs> he liked to go back east and spend a lot of time with his family. And then, as Michael was staying, was a Wells Fargo office. And then in, let's see, December of 1965 to December of 1867, did I say 1965? 1865, yeah, I knew what right, you meant. Yeah, right, right. 100 years in the <laughs> time warp here. Anyway, Governor Henry Blasdale used this office, and it was rented for $50 a month through the state of Nevada. So that's pretty cool. That was probably a lot of money. In those days it was. Yeah. Then, following, it was the CP Railroad Law Office, Land Use Office. So that was interesting to have that in here. Very, very different and lots of different varieties of, of owners that were uh, in the building and, and using it. Now, this is very exciting because in 1870, the famous portrait artist, Cyrus B. Mac McKellen, McClellan, had his studio here. This happens to be one of his famous pictures, and it was called Indian Family, and he painted this in 1881. All right, then next, now this is really, whoop, did I go the right way? Yes, I did. Did I go the right way? Yeah, I did, okay. <laughs> I'm doing this backwards. In 1871, the territorial era attorney, Patrick Henry Clayton, had his office in this building, okay? Now, I want to show you something that's a piece of trivia. See this tomb here? <laughs> in 1997, Patrick Henry, Henry Clayton and his wife, who are interred in this tomb, had their skulls taken. And they were brought back. <laughs> and when they were brought back, when they were found, there were some people at Virginia City that thought it might be nice to have their skulls to use in rituals. So when they brought it back, then they put uh, irons all over the door so they couldn't get into the tomb. That's funny. <laughs> all right. Then in 1875, the post office was here for a brief time while it was being built in the archive building that sits next to the Carson City Nugget now. Yeah. How did you find that bit of information out? About, about How, That was the post office. And what, was it in the records or did It was in some piece of file paper, something that I had. Okay. And it was only here for like maybe three, four, five months tops. Yeah, they moved in here. Oh, I'm sorry, you know what it was? It was a paper, it was a paper article. Okay. And it said, um, actually it said they moved in here for a brief time while that was being built. So three, four, five months, however long it took them Good you know, to build yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, I dug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, there was a time, we're not really sure, but there was a time that around in 1879, there was a brothel here. And if you go out into the front room, the front entrance, you, entrance, you will see a swatch of the red flocked um, wallpaper that was in here. Yeah, I let that so people could see it. When I first acquired the building in 2011, the whole lower story, including this room, was done in this, uh, you know, bordello red um, wallpaper. You can't live with it. It's like looking at an Escher drawing. But I did want to leave one section so people could sort of envision what it looked like. Yeah, it's real pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's real pretty. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, in November 5th of 1894, the lot and the surrounding properties was deeded over to Father Minogue of St. Mary's Hospital, and, well, a church, St. Mary's Hospital, too, Faith. Okay? That was interesting. I did not realize that he owned this. But not long after, <laughs> in July 18, 1898, it was sold, the property was sold to due to delinquent taxes. So he didn't have that, whoop, he didn't have that very long here. But it was kind of interesting that he had interests in Virginia City and then you know, buildings here in Carson too. I guess he was all over the place, to tell you the truth. All right, now this was very interesting. When was it sold, let me see, in 1878, Edward Sweeney sold it to Father Minot and then he brought it back
his, well, he deeded it to his son, which is James G. Sweeney. He deeded it to his son in uh, 1915. Now, he's a very interesting person because uh, James Sweeney, son of Edward D. Sweeney, was the youngest attorney general ever admitted to the United States to this day. He was only 24 years old when he was elected. Mm -hmm. The man was very smart. You can read all about him in this book, and everything that we've been talking about is written in this book, of course, in more extensive than what we're speaking of now. Whoop, I'm sorry. And there he is right there. He was only 24, and here he's sitting right here on this side, the youngest elected attorney general to this date. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Okay. Then, in 1970, the chief northern Nevada train dispatcher, D.S. Morgan, he owned this building. Isn't there been a nice variety, you know, of different store owners, people that have rented and leased the place? So, and that's a cool train, like uh, Sheldon on Big Bang Theory would say. <laughs> <laughs> now here, it gets real interesting. This is William and Emma King. And when they owned the building for quite some time, actually from 1919 to 1944, now, in honor of William, they changed the name of the street that is to the north of the store from um, Lincoln Highway to King Street. And you will also see a beautiful window in the front room that's facing north. Now, that was put in, um, I believe it was put in for Mrs. Emma King because she was a real noted seamstress. And she, um, had the window put in. Actually, it came from a pharmacy that was across the street. And then later on in the 50s, the, the street out here, which was Ormsby, was named to Curry. So lots of changes, like Michael was mentioning earlier. Yeah, probably in 1953 it was Curry, so sometime between 44 and 53 it changed. It changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. awesome. So the Kings owned it for quite some time. And then uh, let me see, they changed it. Now, what was happening was, um, attorney Gary Sharon purchased the property in 1968, and he did extensive renovations to this building because it was getting to be so run down, dilapidated, and in fact, you had a woman come in. You know, I've had several people who lived here from, from the 20s through the 50s, and at one point, the southeast corner roof had caved in. You couldn't live on that side of the building. Uh, but there was only, there, there, there were uh, people living here all through, but it was Gary who pretty much, I think, saved the building from being condemned. He put the money in. I believe he rebuilt the foundation. He, he, he uh, fixed the roof. You know, mm -hmm. he, and I hope that, that's our next revision of the book, is to get Gary to tell us in more details about what he did. But you can see, uh, that it's it's you know, the the, the uh, walk wraparound porch is long gone, and uh, it's starting to fall into disrepair. Yeah, it looked pretty uh, bad. And by what the your customers described it, it was well, pretty unlivable. Well, yeah. Well, that's the one lady who lived here said you know that um, you know, that, that that half of the top story was closed off. Oh, yeah. that's pretty bad. So, but look at it now. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right, and then after that, Robert and Catherine Pollock. Yeah, Bob and oh. Bob and Katie Pollock. Okay, yeah. okay, they owned it briefly in the 1990, and something very very special that they did was they brought in this beautiful bar in 1990. At that time, it was over 100 years old, and they brought it from a. Um, Let's see, they brought it from the Bar of America up in uh, Truckee. In Truckee, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now an overpriced tourist trap and a prominent uh, tavern in, in, uh, in, in Truckee. I guess the deal, he got some sort of deal on it, but he had to bring it in one piece, 21 feet, through the double glass window as we see it. You know, quite a job. And it, it, I don't use it for much in, in the shop, but um, once a month for the wine walk, I hire a bartender. And it's always a popular place. I mean, people have offered to buy it, but you know, why would I? I can't imagine selling it. It's uh, you know, if I only use it once a month, that's good enough. Well, sure, and it's beautiful. Oh yeah, <laughs> awesome. All right. Then in 1991, 
one for quite a few years. The building was owned by William and Gail Cleddy. Yes, uh, William Cleddy, Bud, to, to, to his friends and customers, um, World War II Marine uh, veteran, uh, you know, one of the great authorities on antiques uh, in, in the uh, Carson City area. When I was running uh, my shop in Gardnerville, I, I refer people to Bud. You know, he, Bud did everything. Uh, you know, wood, furniture, glass, uh, you know, paper, you know, metal, you know, guns, everything. I, all I do is books, but Bud was the man while he, while he was here, and apparently, you know, beloved by all. I mean, people still come in, you know, heartbroken to find out he's gone. Oh. <laughs> well, and then here we are in 2011. And, and to, yeah, well, I, I was a customer of Bud's, and I would I would joke with him. So, Bud, when are you going to sell me your building? But he, he said he had no. It wasn't funny to him. He said, "I live here. Why don't you, you know, go away?" <laughs> uh, but uh, Bud died in 2010, and his his goal was to make it to election day, and he did. He made it to, to, to the middle of November, about a week after he, he voted. He, he passed on. Um, and uh, Bill, Bill Jenkins, the gentleman next door who runs Comstock Books, who went to, that property also was associated with this property, uh, called me and said, Mike, you know, the, the, the building will be for sale. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, now is the time. And uh, as the saying goes, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. And uh, I bought the building from the Cleddy, Scott Cleddy, the son, and we did it on a handshake deal. I don't recommend that, but we both were <laughs> acting in good faith, so it worked out okay. Um, they're still, you know, Scott you know, and, and family are still around. Uh, the Pollocks are still around, by the way, so, it, you know, and, and so is Gary Sheeran, who's now, he's older now, but Gary's still with us. Um, if I know how hard it was going to be to Started the business, a bookstore. I would might have thought twice about it. It took me about eight months to get the building in shape for its current iteration. You know, I always dreamed of having a used bookstore, and if you read Sandy's book, it's it's perfect. You know, it's, you know, it's, it seems karmic, natural progression to make this into a bookstore, and you know, I'm happy to be here and continue the tradition, you know, my predecessors, and and keeping this as a prominent bit of local history and. Thank you again for helping with that task. Well, sure. Yeah. Well, can you tell our viewers how you got interested in a bookstore? Well, I said, I, I, my wife and I used to travel around the country looking at all the used bookstores and, you know, we could. We, we would travel America to see its bookstores. And um, we always thought this would be our good, this would be our retirement. And we had an idea of what we wanted. Every bookstore we'd go in, we'd say, well, we like this, we don't like that. But we always thought, this building was built to be a used bookstore. Um, and so again, uh, my wife passed in 2008. She didn't live to see this, but um, you know, a lot of our ideas you know, you know, we incorporate in the design. Many people contributed to the, uh, you know, to the, you know, to the, uh, the layout. You know, I hired an interior decorator to replace that lovely red Bordello wallpaper you can see oh. around that it, it's uh, easier to live with the, 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 the faux olds, my designer called it. Um, but uh, this, this um, is a, just a this like that fits into Carson City. You know, it just gives it, uh, keeps the charm and the history of the building um, alive. Well, it does. Yeah. And you have done wonderful with it. Well, thank you. This building loves you. I can just feel it. This building loves you. Well, it was a big thing. The vibe is good. It had, you know, just I think whatever spirits here are fairly benevolent. I mean, just once in a while, books get shifted around. I can't tell if it's staff or customers or the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the ghost saying, "Well, I need we need to put that over there." Right. No. Oh, fun. No. <laughs> well, now that's all right. Well, just briefly, a little bit about me. My very first book actually wasn't written until 2007. And it was called Finville Investigators, and it was 27 of our stories of different places that we'd investigated. Now, before that, I was a published poet in different magazines and newspapers and different books. But outside of that, throughout my life, I just didn't have time to write books, but now I do. 
and you'll love this one, <laughs> if I can say so. Everything that Michael and I have talked about and further what we're going to be talking about is all written in this book. You can purchase it online at my website, which is www.sandypsychicstones, or you can purchase it right here at Morley's Books. Yep. Cool. You, have a large, you have a large credit built up. Your daughter will have a field day. <laughs> That's right, I do. <laughs> well, I thank you for that. All yeah. right. I would like to introduce you to a paranormal investigative group that I am part of, Finvale Investigators. This happens to be Carolyn Burton and Jack Alvedo and Carol Clemens. Chantel couldn't make it today, but she's right there hugging, <laughs> hugging Jack. <laughs> and I would like to talk to you about, and we would like to talk to you about the spirit, some of the spirits that we have saw, seen, captured, talked to, captured on film, and video inside this wonderful building. We have met some of the most awesome spirits. Now, one that I would like to talk to you about is when I first started coming to Morley's Books, there is this cute, cute little boy. And he's about five years old, he wears knickers, and whoop, that's Arlene, she's not a spirit. There. <laughs> this happens to be Holly, and the little boy loves to follow Holly the dog around and the little boy is right there. And he's about five, wears knickers, has this humongous white bow right here on his shirt. So I'm not quite sure what time era that is, but he's a pretty cute little guy and he's always here and he's here right now with us too. Now another very exciting happening that we all saw, including Arlene, which we'll be introducing you to here in just a minute. There is three rooms towards the north, uh, I'm sorry, the east of this building. And for many times that I've been in here, I have seen like a black shadow man walk through. Well, one time we were all here for a book signing and all of us, including Arlene, smelled cigar smoke. And it was so powerful. Yes, it was. It was. <laughs> very strong, mm -hmm. very strong. But yeah. it only lasted for a few minutes and then it disappeared. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like somebody was passing through or something. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if maybe the black shadow man was, you know, kind of smoking as an old fogey stogie <laughs> as he was walking mm -hmm. by. It was incredible because not just we, Thin Veil, uh, uh, smelled the smoke. The customers that were in the store also smelled it. So that was incredible. Now, another one that we found, actually Carolyn found him, by the name of Horace, and he was an old man, 86. We feel that he had a stroke, but when we asked him, actually, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit and talk about EVPs. EVPs are, well, I can't jump ahead. I'll get to that in just a minute. EVPs is electronic voice phenomenon, and Carolyn was using dowsing rods, which we use to communicate with the spirits, and you asked him about his arm. Well, when I was using the dowsing rods, my left arm was aching. Mm -hmm. And so I was only getting the dowsing rods to work on one side. And we asked him what was wrong, what happened. And uh, he told us that he had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. But you thought he might have had cancer. Might have had cancer or maybe perhaps a stroke. Well, I'm not a stroke. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's okay because, well, we're not really sure. But it's just when we had the EVP session with him, you asked about his arm and he says it's dead. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes. It's dead. So that was, that was pretty that interesting. Was pretty cool. sure. yes. Yeah. Well, now we've all seen, too, uh, there's a phantom cat that actually runs around. Let me see if I can get the picture here. That's the, that's, this is the three rooms where the spirit man walks through. He walks from the, the door to the south, right out the window. <laughs> he doesn't use the door, he goes through the window. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh yes, and here is Carolyn dousing for Horace, which you can see he showed up right there. That's pretty cool. We were all in the room with her experiencing Horace, and he showed up actually in quite a few of the pictures. So he was very happy to talk with us. He also told me his name. That's Horace. right. He communicated to Carolyn that his name was Horace. Mm -hmm. and, and two, we asked him why he stays in this building. And he said, just because it's comfortable. 
He likes it here. I don't see why nobody would not like it here. This is a cool building and a cool book. I love this building. <laughs> yes, I do too. <laughs> All right. Oh, I forgot about her. We'll get back with her in just a second. This is the, the room where I see a, lot, a spirit cat running around all over the place. He's, he's funny, I don't know if he's catching a spirit mouse or what, but he has a lot of fun running around this, this group right out here. <laughs> all right, maybe that's the one you saw going up the stairs was the spirit cat. <laughs> all right, now also too, right beyond this wall that's behind the bar here, I first saw a lady, she's a lady of the evening, she's kind of in a ratty yellow dress, and she always stands about the second or third step. She's always smirking like me. So anyway, she's very interesting. And it's like, I don't really like to be around her too often because she just doesn't have that good of energy. It's not that she's mean or anything. She's just maybe tired out <laughs> or worn out. <laughs> OK, now we're back to the cat. Now, in the bathroom, this is really interesting. Um, the bathroom, a lot of people feel like they're being watched, and I do too. And my daughter, everybody has felt like they're being watched when they're, well, having to use the facility. So, <laughs> and it's not a very nice feeling. It's like, okay. <laughs> you know, when you're sitting there. That's not right. watching you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a very weird sensation. Many, many times I have been here just sitting, hanging out, and somebody will stand on my uh, it happens too when I'm standing. I feel a shoe or foot, something, just go right on the top of my foot. And it's not comfortable. It doesn't hurt. But it's like it's a feeling where it's just not comfortable. <clears throat> okay, so that's another one. All right. Now, another thing that we have heard here, especially out in front here, um, is uh, horses neighing, walking, snorting. We can hear the stagecoach, leather creaking, different things. And it was brought to my attention then by uh, Dan Kaffer that works here, that this was at one time a Wells Fargo office. And so that's very interesting. I've captured that on EVP, the horse's name. So that's, that's pretty cool. All right. Now there's a storage room in here, and this is very interesting too, because customers that have gone back in there who have been, it's, it's kind of like a room that goes into a room that goes into a room in this building. And so they'll accidentally meander into the storage room and they will come back out and I have heard them say, oh, there's something not right in there. They don't know what it is, but it's something not right. Now we veilers and also some of our friends that have been here have also felt that. We, have told, we haven't told them anything, but we've had our friends and family members come in here and they say the same thing. It's like, there's something not right back there. Not evil, horrible, just, again, not right, okay? So we've all felt that too, and we've all taken pictures back in there and gotten some interesting anomalies. So, <clears throat> now this is really interesting. Right here in this room, in the bar room, many, many, many times, I have seen a man that looks like he's dressed in 1960s clothing. He's got the short sleeve white shirt, the narrow tie, the real tight fit pants. And he just sits here and smiles. Sometimes he's looking out the window and he's smiling. And I've tried to communicate with him because, as you know, I have an ability where I can see those that have crossed over. He never talks, but he'll just sit there and smile. I don't even know if he's drinking or not, but he just likes to sit here. And that's pretty cool. All right, now the basement. I'm going to let them tell you about the basement because I didn't go in there. <laughs> what did you guys feel when you went in there? Go ahead, Jack. Uh, it wasn't, we really didn't get a lot in the basement. Uh, a couple of corpses. Um, it was cool being down there. Mm -hmm. and I'd like to go back down there, but I didn't really feel too much in there. Okay, yeah. Um, to me, it felt kind of kind of different, like off placement. Um, and to me it seemed like it went further out than what the small room is down there. Like it extended out at one oh. point. It felt a lot bigger than what it should have been. In other words, what we saw down there. 
Well, what would you say the size of it? Like 12 by maybe a 12 by 20? 12 by 20 or 12 by, or at least a 12 by 12. So that's but interesting that you felt that, that it was. But it seemed like it would it was a lot bigger. Uh-huh. And some aspects, yeah. Right. And you too? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What did you feel? Like there was more to it. Mm -hmm. than, that the space we were in was the space we were in. But at one point there was more to it. There was more room in there. Interesting. That's called a spatial anomaly, by the way, where you just feel that things are bigger. Like in the movies, you know things will move out like that. Yeah. It's called spatial anomaly. So that's interesting that you guys felt that. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And I know Chantel didn't feel very good down there. She didn't want to stay down there. No, she, no, she, she wanted to come she back. Down, she got she sick. Was down kind of, and yeah, she, she was down come back for just a short time. And she was like, I gotta get out of here. Really? Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I remember that. that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, let's see. That's about. Um, well, that's just briefly, so, oh, I forgot about Louisa. Um, just briefly, some of the anomalies that we have captured here. There's a lot more that are in the book that we Thin Baylors have um, captured on film, recordings, cool. Now, this is really interesting because we were all in on this. Again, in the staircase, we kept feeling a very, very strong entity. We'll come to find out. It was a teenager, and she at first was very shy but then she got real chatty. And she was more or less asked to be here at a very young age, not that she liked that kind of life, just the only life that she knew how to live. But she was here, and you can see her here, right above me, I was using Dossing Run to Dossing. Everybody got tons of pictures with her orb in there somewhere, <laughs> around all of us when we were on the staircase. So that's very interesting that uh, and she told you guys her name, Louise, yes. Louisa. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, she did. And we could all feel her. Yeah. We could all feel oh, her. Image. Yeah. We picked up a lot on the staircase. Yeah. That was. Yeah. And we felt like we were being watched all the time. At least I did. Oh, I sure. Like, yeah. yeah. I think we caught EVPs. Yeah, we caught a few EVPs on the. On she the said she was 15 or 16. That's right. That's yes. right. How yeah. interesting. Isn't that fun? All right. Okay, now as I was speaking, <clears throat> EVP, electronic voice phenomena, which is ghost speak, we happen to capture well, a lot of that. <laughs> and a, yes, most we did. Of, <laughs> a lot of it is written in the book, but just briefly, as we were talking before, Horace, when Carolyn asked him what was wrong with his arm, he said it's dead. And then we talked about, too, about the, the horse's name, and the, the, we could hear the carriages creaking, wheels and the, the leather creaking. Now another thing too is, um, I don't know if we can pick this up here so I'll add it in when I'm editing, but when we were upstairs, upstairs is where Michael Morley has his uh, residences. It's a couple of bedrooms, couple of bathrooms, kitchen, dining room, living room, things like that. Well we were up there, of course, investigating, and all of a sudden when we got home and we were listening to our recording, three thunderous knocks, and none of us heard that. In yep. fact, in the recording, we're all just talking, you know, like we are now, and then all of a sudden behind us, boom, 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 and none of us rec uh, could uh, hear it. We didn't recognize it because if we did, we would have said something on the recording about it. So I will add that. Now, another time, too. The, we, this is kind of cute, we were asking, like we do, is there any spirit that would like to talk with us? And one said, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so they are comical. <laughs> now, speak, I believe that you captured this one, that we were talking about the history of this building. And a female voice came on and said, reminisce. And that yeah, was that was, that was that, clear. Yeah, that was special. Yeah, that they know that we're speaking of their time era, and that's nice. Now another one too. This is very interesting. Again, we recorded this. We're kind of talking amongst ourselves. We did not hear this. It's a breathy whistle. It's kind of like none of us heard that, but it was captured. So I'll add that in when I'm editing too. 
I want to thank you, Carol, Jack, Carolyn, for being a part of this wonderful show. It's nice to have you on this side of the camera because normally you're on yeah, that yeah, side yeah, of the yeah, camera. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so this is real nice that you are here to join us. Don't, don't. One thing I uh -huh. wanted to add you was bet. the EVP of the little boy mm -hmm. because it was that was very distinct and clear. We got him. Actually, you caught him yes, in the, I I in the kitchen him in the upstairs. Kitchen and stuff because I, I was, I had taken a picture earlier of the cabinets and then it was just a little while later I was taking another picture and a lot of the cabinet doors were open and I was trying, I was explaining it to Sandy, I says I have a picture on here. Well while I'm talking with Sandy, I caught an EVP of the little boy saying, Sandy, Sandy, it was me. That's and right. I, I've got to get that EVP from you so I can add it to yes, the lecture. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it, it was, and then he said something else, but it was like kind of muffled. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make that out, and I was like, "Oh, that was so cool!" So oh. I wanted to make sure I shared that oh. again. Yeah, with you that because that was like one of the best. That was one of the best it. ones yeah. we really caught. Oh, I'm glad you did share that with our yes. viewers today. Awesome. All right. Well. What I'm going to do is, oh, here we are, the Vale Investigators and Arlene. We're going to get Arlene in here, and we are going to speak with her briefly. I would like to introduce you to Arlene LaFerry. Her name is right there, and her pretty little picture. She, as I mentioned, was very instrumental in the history of this book. And so I would like to have her speak a little bit about herself. How did you get so interested in history? I started out as a volunteer up at the Historic Society because I wanted to know a little bit more about Nevada. And when I retired, I went up there as a docent, started out in manuscripts, and now I work in the uh, library doing research. And uh, people would come in and ask questions, and. Mostly it was about their dead relatives, and then pretty soon it got to be a joke. I was always digging up dirt on dead people. So consequently, I started uh, doing a lot of research on uh, the Nevada uh, cemeteries, and one thing led to another with the cemeteries. Naturally, it's the local people in the town and everything else. So the next thing I know is here I am all over the place, and I enjoy doing it. And uh, I really have a lot of fun on dead people. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> the book is full of wonderful history that Arlene has researched. And how long have you been at the Nevada Historical Society? I went through my docent training in 1984, and then I went through uh, a second set of docent training about 11 years ago. And I'm up there uh, twice a week working in the library, and in the last 11 years, I've gotten about 5,500 hours under my belt. <laughs> yes, you just got an award a couple of months ago for the hours that yes. you put in. Yes, yeah. a little dangle on my little, uh, my little name tag. Yes, awesome. Well, you deserve that and so Thank many you. more rewards. Cool. Arlie LaFerry, everyone, very instrumental in this and quite a few of my other historic paranormal books that, that I've written and what we've written two, which I'm going to boast, are weird books. <laughs> yes, and more to come. Too. And more to come. Thank you so much, Arlene, for being at the lecture today. Yay! Yeah, so if you're in Carson City, I hope you will visit the shop. It's located at 201 West King Street, which is the corner of Curry King, one block west of the State Capitol building. There is a website, www.morleysbooks.com, and we're on ABE Books, that's www.abebooks.com, uh, under Morley's Books. Uh, the phone number of the shop is 775-883-3932. We're open 11 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday. Thanks. And Sandy, thank you. Oh, well, thank yeah, you. This yeah, has been fun, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> and 
she's on the stairs and she stays here. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Alright. Well, we hope you enjoyed the lecture. It sure is a wonderful building and a wonderful place and a wonderful bookstore. Now, if you would like to be a guest on my Psychic Creation Show, you can get a hold of me at my website, which is www.sandypsychicstones.com. Thank you for watching Psychic Creations, and we'll see you next show. Welcome to more of these books. Thanks. Tell me about your store. Well, this is a this is part of the old Carson City, the so-called Sweeney Building. This building was built in 1864, finished a few months prior to statehood. Um, it's in the historic district. This is building that started out as the Wells Fargo livery, not the bank, but uh, you know, we had a, like a Pony Express stop. You know, horse, people would get you know store things here and get a you know change their horses out and. And uh, it also upstairs was the first apartment for the governor of Nevada, for the governor of Nevada, whose name I don't recall, but the, the first governor. Okay. Um, you can see behind you the pictures of the shop and its various stages of life, and the, and the oldest one is that little Degaro type with the volunteer fire department in front of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see there's nothing around it, so this building has some claim to be the oldest two-story, freestanding commercial building in uh, Carson City. Uh, it's been this iteration. Uh, I've had the store open for two years now. Before that, it was an antique store, and before that, it was a law office. And it's been almost everything you can imagine, I think, since 1864. I, I imagine every every human act known to man has been uh, performed here. Um, the facts, this tin ceiling is facsimile from the 70s. The only everything here has been remodeled. The only true original architecture left is in the upper basement, upper basement, upper attic, where you can find these massive 14 by 14 beams that must have been hauled down from Lake Tahoe. I left that little piece of the uh, wallpaper, which used to be all through the lower story, but after a while it hurts your eyes to look at it. So I left that one little piece so people could see what it looked like and put in this sort of faux, uh, you know, faux brown, which is easier on the eyes. Um, this is a small shop, about 15,000 books currently on the shelves, mm -hmm. meant to be run by one person, although it can be run by two people on busy days. Um, I, you know, the, the sign out says it's a unique bookstore, and people ask me what makes it unique. I say, it's unique because I carry what I want. But that also means I have to, you know, I specialize in Carson history, Sierra Nevada, Gold Rush, Comstock, uh, Western Americana. In addition to literature high points, you know, but I can't. This, this can't be Barnes and Noble, which will typically house 150,000 books. Mm -hmm. you know, this this is one tenth the size. So I carry, you know, my, the subset that I you know that I think I can make a living out of and what amuses me. Right, right. Um, What's in this case here? Got well, this is sort of some of the you know, the high end items. Um, Usually uh, of some interest, like there's that, that first of Clan of the Cave Bear, that's the one that put Gene all on the map. Um, it is a signed copy. It's you know there's a certain magic in having a book that the author had in their hands, especially because she wasn't well known, and that's you know makes it more interesting because you know you got her you know, if if you had had her sign the book then you know she she was an up and comer. Exactly. The book next to that is the, is the is the high end book in the store that is a first edition first printing of Huckleberry Finn uh, by Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's been professionally restored, but uh, it's, you know, this is sort of a Twain, this is a Twain locale. Orion Clemens once had an office in this building, and so it's probable that Mark Twain has been in this, in this building, although I don't know it, or I mess up a good story with the truth. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I carry, I have a whole shelf you know, for, for 20 items, but this is the high, that's, that's the, uh, the high end in the store. Wow. 
I prefer not to have it lock away, but you also mm -hmm. want to display it nicely. Mm -hmm. I am in the business to sell books. This is not a museum. My, you know, my, my working motto is keep stock moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, here's another interesting item. This is about the Donner Party. And this is a signed copy. Again, you know, it's you know, always interesting when the author can sign a book because you know you have a little piece of history in your hand. A guy named McClatton. Um, don't know if it's still widely read. There's a Steinbeck first edition, very reasonable for the starting Steinbeck collector, but uh, you know, I have lots of reading copies. I mean, not everyone in Carson City wants to spend you know, big money on a collectible copy, so I have reading copies. You know, I mean, people still read Cannery Row, Grapes of Wrath, and so on. I read it too when I was a kid. So let's look at the rest of the store. Well, this is the main room where most of the uh, Western Americana books are, are located. Um, again, what, what I carry most is uh, Nevada Anna, and uh, Gold Rush, uh, Comstock, Lake Tahoe, uh, the Sierras, Reno history, Carson history. Okay. And we have this categories, we have railroads, although there's um, you know, Nevada, and this is what most reliably sells. I mean, in, in a material world, you, have, you can't carry everything that amuses you. You actually have to sell a few books. Right. <laughs> um, more, more Western Americana here. Again, notice the ceilings above us. Those, that is facsimile. You can see the real thing in Virginia City or, uh, or Bodie, but that was the you know, old rage at one time. Um, the more, the, the best stuff, can't see it here. But on the, it's off camera. It's in the under glass to keep it out of the sun. Okay. You know, low you know, Nevada is blessed with low humidity, so we don't have to worry too much about uh, humidity damage. Um, and what's this case here? This is a map case. Although I store any kind of paper that might might amuse oh. you. Yeah. Um, it is antique. When I, when I first bought it, I found a black widow's nest at the bottom, so oh. you're always a little <laughs> careful. Yeah. Um, but this, you know, if this people, people, this is the sort of thing people browse. I mean, we have a Marilyn Monroe connection here. Yeah. Lots of Marilyn Monroe books. My wife was a big fan. Of course, they shot the Misfits here in, in Nevada, so okay. it remains an enduring theme for. Sure. Um, but it's it, it, it's not really it's not a sale item. It just looks nice. Yeah, it does. You know, same with the marble table and um, a lot of the other things here are just for decoration. People ask if I'll sell them. I said no. It's part of the decor of the shop. Of course, if anyone offered you enough money, you'd say, well, okay. I guess I'll <laughs> yeah. make an exception. Sure. Behind you, we're going we're gonna to walk this way. This, these, this is the dollar rack. Everything on the, um, on, the, on the cart is a buck. And not everyone wants to spend for fancy collectibles. Sure. And I always want, you want to encourage kids especially to read. So I have a, you know, anything I can't sell after a while goes on the dollar rack. Okay. I'd rather have it get, you know, again, my philosophy is keep the stock moving. Yeah. Don't, you know, this is a working bookstore, not a museum. And there's few of us enough left. You know? Yeah, well, and everybody's on a budget too. So yeah. That's what you seek out a lot yeah. of times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the second book room. Uh, this is you know, more traditional bookstore-ish, you might say. We have uh, uh, history, fiction, biography, science fiction, fantasy, business, economics, uh, war, vintage literature, self-help, philosophy, religion, and this this this, this uh, swivel. Carousel, another item that we got from uh, Borders when they went out of business. Anything I can't find a place for it goes here, and and the prices are uh, prices are across the map. But generally, anyone from out of town, I you know looking for something unusual comes here. You know, here for example, this is Che Guevara's manual on guerrilla warfare. You know, maybe I shouldn't even have this out to just get the kids from getting their hands on it. But I don't do too much censorship. Um, you know, and so, oh, there's probably a, maybe a, a thousand, 1,500 books in here. Wow. Yeah, and you know, again, um, I carry what amuses me, but I try also to, to reflect the area, what people want to buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the history. Yeah, the, the history, and especially, uh, I mean, we, we are a, a military, you know, a lot of ex-military, ex retired military here, so that always, that always goes well. Well, I have you know, as time has gone on, I have a regular customer base that comes by every month or two to see what's new. 
So that's the other reason, keep the stock moving. If I don't know to sell in six months, I move it on out. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a little artwork. Um, you see that fake Picasso behind yeah, me. I saw yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> left unloaded on someone. I thought, yeah, I thought, I thought it would, you know, it would do well, but it's just too darn big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this chandelier here, you see, this this came with the shop, uh, but it, it's 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 replica vintage. I mean, this is what they had, maybe even with real candles, a century and a half ago. And again, you notice the tin ceiling that is a facsimile from the '70s. Okay. Um, a lot of this kind of touches throughout the store, stained glass and paneling and the roofing, uh, all, all as it was in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, they put, someone put a lot of money into the place to try and make it replica. Right, yeah. Yeah. it has a, a, quite a charm though, it makes it comfortable. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and the location here is, is awesome. We are, this is the heart of the old Carson City Historic District. So. They tell you in restaurant business, location, 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 true for any retail. And you know, we depend on both tourist and local trade, but this is the heart of old Carson City. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful building. Yeah. yeah. A wonderful collection of books, really. The variety is just perfect. Well, I've been collecting these since the 1980s. And my wife and I used to vacation across the country looking for books. Oh. We'd go into some small town, you know, go into a Motel 6, get the phone book, this is you know, pre-cell phone days, tear out the list of bookstores, <laughs> and uh, just the next spend, spend the next day going through them all. And we, in pre-internet days, we would ship home by the box. Oh. We came to Nevada with 11,000 books. Wow. Yeah. And of course, I've, once people know you're buying books, they come out of the woodwork. Oh. Pretty soon, nowadays, I, I turn most books away. You know, my rule now is if I can't sell it, I don't buy it. Oh, okay. But um, I have a whole room full of mistakes, you know, books I should not have bought. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, um, that was our passion. You know, the dream was always to have a shop. But of course, the internet has turned the world upside down in all collectible fields. Mm -hmm. You know, it's leveled the playing field for buyers and sellers. You know, in the old days, what, you know, we used to acquire knowledge the hard way. Now you can do one or two searches on Google and get the same information that you had to spend years to acquire before, which is good and bad. Right. But you have to kind of, you, but you know, the, the natural laws have changed, so you have to evolve with them. Sure. You know, some of the old-time booksellers have never really embraced the internet, mm -hmm. and those, you know, those are dying out. I mean, right. you know, whatever's left of the antiquarian bookstores has sort of had to adopt new technology, and a good portion of that business is now online. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but of course, you know, you know, people still want to handle the books, and yeah, nothing, nothing beats you know, holding in your hand and really reading. Yeah, and some books will never go electronic media. Some of these art books, you know, like the Remington, yeah. you're not gonna get that kind of artwork. Sure. In, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a handheld tablet, you want to see, mm -hmm. you know, the gorgeous paper and smell the ink and handle it. You know, some of the finer print books are art objects in their own right. You know, yeah. they're not just books, but they're little works of art. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and you just don't get that on a Kindle. You know? No, you don't. Yeah. No. And, and that's not to just, I think the Kindle has its place. Anything that gets people to read is a, is a good thing. I agree. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I use a Kindle on vacation to hold all my tour books. That means you just keep it in your, your one, one item one in your thing. back pocket and not have a backpack full of tour books. That's true, that's true. Yeah. And do you have an online website then? Yes, I do. I will give you a business card before you leave, www.morleysbooks.com. And it's pretty informational, but I do have items for sale, but mostly it's just to say, hey, I'm here. Right. You know, I generally found it easier to farm out my commerce to other sites. And I just direct people to those oh, locations. Okay. eBay and ABE Books okay. is, yeah. is where, and they, they do charge you for it, but it, you know, it's sort of trading time for money. And that's part of the, the online world. Is you can do it yourself if you have the time, mm -hmm. or you can give someone a small percentage and list use their listing service. Right, kind of be a link to their site. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah and, uh, and if you have a thousand small booksellers like me, all putting our you know um, our books for sale online in the same location, mm -hmm. now you have a data center. You can see you know what people are, you know, what books are for sale, what prices are going. You know, one of the first edition points. Again, it's that part of the leveling of the playing field that I was telling you about. Everyone can go to these sites and gather the same data 
from one location rather than having to go from shop to shop to yeah. shop. Yeah, online shopping. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's becoming the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is the the kids' room, although other books are here as well. Uh, we have the old classics like you know, Charlotte's Web and uh, um, you know, Nancy Drew and uh, Horatio Alger and, and a few others. But there's also hobbies, uh, animals, cats and dogs, uh, how to, um, you, know, you know, anything that wouldn't fit in the in the other 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 rooms. Um, you will notice the low ceiling. We sort of we put this drape to sort of hide how how in fact that's so much lower than the rest of the ceilings in the building. The reason why is there is a room in the middle of the of the um, of the building. It's not a second story. It's sort of stuck between these two stories. Oh. Okay. And uh, we we found it found the entrance. It's almost like Winchester Mystery House. You know, <laughs> you know the romantic part of me thinks maybe it was a speakeasy during Prohibition times because yeah. you can stand up in there. You can put planking in and. and build a room out of it, but it's not easily accessible. Um, you know, there's also a true basement that we didn't even know was here until we started moving bookcases aside. Um, you know, so it sort of, you know, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, the it, it sort of brings up a boy in me to say, you know, I think I have, you know, hidden passages and stairways yeah. to nowhere and, uh -huh. and, and so on. Um, again, the best stuff's in the glass case. Okay. Um, but designer originally had that tilted, it said it gives it a little more dynamic activity, and I said, posh, and I pushed it against the wall, but now I think she's right. It actually would activate a little if I brought it out, but more space efficient this way. Yeah. This is one of the sort of thing I read as a kid, you know, Tom Swift and his Cosmotron Express. Okay. Thought it was, you know, kids don't seem to read as much nowadays, but I still have it, just for myself, if no one else. Yeah. And the Hardy Boys. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, this this very nice for presenting uh, books. I find that, you know, that I can put a, a book on how to sell ice cubes to an Eskimo, and if it's on a, an end cap, it sells. You know, just anything on an end cap, anything that's well displayed yeah. sells. And that's, that's what I'm learning about this business. Is it's not how much it's, it's how much you know is only a small part of it. You know, display and promotion is everything. A retail mentality that I have to develop. Um, now this is the last public room uh, in the Sweeney building. Um, it is a bar. You can see it dominated by Cat you know, Val, who actually runs the place. The rest of us are staff. Um, we'll let that go. Uh, this, came, this bar area is 21 feet, and it came from the Bar of America in Truckee if you are familiar. Okay. It is turn of the last century. It's like 1900, 1910. Um, the stained glass is from some local artisan, I don't know who, and uh, the, the, the cabinetry, the, you know, the, the, the ornate woodwork is from some place back east. Um, and the mirror glass is from uh, Home Depot. Um, however, I don't really use this as a book display room, though you will notice a few books here and there. On Wine Walk, which is the first Saturday of every month, I hire a bartender and we open this room up to public. Um, being the Nevada, they have to walk all the way through the book section so I can sell them something okay. before they get to have their free wine. Oh, okay. And sometimes um, we'll have a, either a musician here or maybe one of the local writers or poets.